Hi there, you're welcome to another episode of Founders Connect. Here I have conversations with amazing entrepreneurs and operators of leading African tech startups. Today I'm having a conversation with Yomi Adedeji. I know you know him already. He's the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Softcom. Has been doing this for like almost 13 years now. That's a long time. Yeah. I checked your LinkedIn and I saw only Softcom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and Softcom is a leading technology, technology solutions company based in Lagos and the makers of AO, which is also a very popular digital bank in Nigeria. So we're going to sit down today and learn all about Yomi first and then learn about you know his journey to building Softcom and all the other products and achievements that they've had so make sure you stay and watch this video to the end. Hi there my name is PC Timmy and welcome to Founders Connect a show where I spotlight the best of African innovation by hosting conversations with leading and emerging founders and operators in the African tech space. The goal is to discover the stories, learn the ideologies, the obstacles they overcame, the lessons they learned along the way, and very importantly, to document their journeys. Do like and comment on this video as you watch it, and please subscribe to my channel. I promise, there's always something fantastic to learn here. Enjoy the video. Hi, Yomi. Hi. Hi, Peace. How are you doing? Good, good, good. I'm glad that we're finally having this conversation. Yeah, finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, we'll just start with you first. So the format is learn about the person and okay. they would somehow obviously get Guaranteed. into the company. So just tell me about growing up, your background, where mm. you born, what was childhood like? Yeah, I mean, uh, I grew up in Ibado. I was born in Ibado. Okay. Um, and I think my early ed my childhood education, education was in Ibado, uh, primary school, college. Um, I would say critical moments in my upbringing was going to College of Science. So getting out of high school and pretty much going into science school. Interesting. So, so not uni? So what, what you call uh, SS1. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't go into SS1. Oh. I stopped at GS3 and pretty much went to College of Science. And so I think I've been focused on science for, for a very long time. For about, I would also say like that pretty much set the foundation for, for me as a person um, in terms of like the work that I do now and uh, growing up was fun. I, I'm the last child of three kids uh, from my mom, um, so I was very pampered. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, growing up was fun. I went to went to Covenant University uh, after college or after high school in, in principle. So after the um, science school, it was yeah. in Covenant. Then it was at Covenant University. I did three years in the science school. Um, then studied information systems. Um, I actually wanted to study computer engineering, but like I didn't want to stay in school for five years. So after the first <laughs> year, I changed from computer engineering to. Oh, so you got admission for computer engineering? Yeah, I did well. computer engineering for for the first year, then changed to information systems in the second year. Um, yeah, so that's mostly like. What what's what's one fun or core memory that you remember from your childhood? Hmm. Um, getting into College of Science. It Why was, did you go to College of Science? Though? So it was literally like a, like a path laid down for me as a person. I didn't choose it myself. Okay, uh, so your mom or your dad? My dad. My dad is an engineer. So um, he just wanted all of us to be in his own <laughs> image, I, I guess. Um, so my, my elder brother also did the same thing. Mm. When stopped at GS3, then went to College of Science. So just grew into that age. Um, my elder brother is six years older than me. So, so, so pretty much when I when I get into a school, he leaves the school. We, we kind of like already. <laughs> Same with my elder brother. So oh, really, yeah. So, yeah. so when I get into GS one, he's like exiting the school, right? So um, going into College of Science was the only time I didn't meet him in school. So mm. it was a, he's always my welcome, you know, <laughs> my welcome buddy. Like takes me through school, um, but because of College of Science was just three years, he had left three years before I entered. Yeah. Right. So. Um, Moving from being with my mom and into what seemingly was like, how I'll say like almost like an indoctrination into science mm. it was it was quite a, it was it was rumbling for me. I didn't do well in my first year because mm. uh, the transition from just learning like um, regular like being in regular high school to now finding myself among so many bright people from everywhere like um, and just. No brother who used to like be there to like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so was College of Science in Ibadan? It was in Ibadan as well. Right. So that was a bit like, um, uh, quite quite like a, a rumble. But I think after the first year, I, I pretty much um, became accustomed to like the, the idea and ideas of science. 
Um, I was also born in the car. That's like an interesting thing about me. Yeah. That's a so, really good fun fact. Yeah. So <laughs> my mom was trying to get to the hospital. Well, she was in one at home when like she felt like she needed to like so made it downstairs, made it to the car, and started driving, but couldn't make it to the hospital. She was driving herself. Yeah, literally. So <laughs> literally came back to me in the car. Um, and sometimes I think maybe that's why I like to be always be like I'm always there on the go. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's all like. Uh, a uh, very strong, very strong woman. Um, what again, childhood, childhood? Um, so I, I, my, my folks are divorced. Like my, my, my parents don't live together. Mm. And that was, I didn't meet them. I didn't grow up to leave, meeting them. So maybe from like when I was two years old. So I never really met an I, the idea of like a house that mm. we were living together. So I always enjoyed living with my dad sometimes and being with my mom. That gave me a lot of freedom. Right. Um, so one time, I tried to go from my mom's house to my dad's house, then I got lost. Yeah, I got lost for like three days. Wow. Yeah, literally. <laughs> that was not the God lost that I talked about. Yeah, so, it. so it's not like I got lost, but because there were no mobile phones, there was literally no way to find me. Wow. What had happened was on my way, I saw one of my mom's friends and she picked me up. So she took me to her house, like, you know what, like, when your mom, why are you, where are you going, you're me? Like, when, maybe when your mom is looking for you, she'll find me. And maybe she also just didn't, there was no mobile phone. She was probably busy, so she didn't make any conscious effort to reach out to my mom. She just expected that. Yeah, okay. So like, after that occurrence, right, um, I think it pretty much resolved the issue between my parents. Mm. Because they just, they just couldn't live with the idea of like, where, where am I? And they couldn't find me. And they got back together, literally. Oh, <laughs> that time, okay. Yeah, yeah from, that, from, that, from that event, yeah. So I think those are like, Things are How old were you at that time? Uh, maybe eight or nine. Eight. Nine. Interesting. Yeah. Was did was there any difference or like do you feel like seeing your parents live together and then come back together has any influence on? Yeah, I think it does. Um, and possibly there was a major difference. I think being being apart, um, and growing up with my mom uh, mostly and like. Having to visit my dad, I was very independent, very early. Like, so I, I did things myself. Mm. Um, so I wasn't necessarily the ideals of like a, I was. I was very independent. But then seeing them come together also showed me what it meant to be together. Mm. I lost some privileges. So <laughs> pocket money from both sides wasn't coming anymore, right? Because sometimes I think they have to. They try to outdo themselves. <laughs> um, so it was now like oh, they were now like doing things together. Yeah. And just seeing how, even from a from a family structure point of view, like seeing how things that were difficult became a bit more like easy. Things that um, things that meant like we will be trying to figure out like where do we spend Christmas? Like mm -hmm. I spend Christmas with my dad, I spend with my mom, um, and I would say that left a lot of impressions on me. Um, and possibly what I why I've like carried on mentally as. I always will have a partner as a person. Like mm. I, I always will like it set like the foundation for for the concept of like partnerships for me, mm. um, and also also set the foundation for the concept of resolving differences. Even though I was young, I saw how something that was important to both of them pretty much brought them yeah. back to like you know what like we need to figure this out. Uh, and my mom had to like really sacrifice a lot. She had to leave Ibadan, move to go stay with him. You know, so they mm. kind of like at you, and I saw like how how that could, how people who were like, they're two strong people, two strong characters. Um, my mom is very entrepreneurial, she's a teacher. My dad is an engineer, I'm very hard on him, if so was the case. So, so I saw how they could like, pull all that aside and just try yes. to come back together. Yeah, I think that left some impression on me. So, summary of childhood and like growing up. You had a very yeah. interesting childhood. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about coming at university. I mean, people talk a lot about I mean, I think lots of people I've spoken to about Covenant University, when they leave, they're like, oh my God, oh, I'm so glad I went to Covenant. Yeah. But while you're there, like, I don't want to be yeah. here. Was that your experience as well? Um, for me, it was a bit different. Um, it was different because Covenant was my last attempt at, at like, college education. Mm. How do you mean? So when I finished uh, College of Science, I'd already in some way started trying to build something. You know? mm. Uh, then it was mostly hardware, so let's try to couple a computer and try to make a computer. And my interest in education was very minimal. And my dad was really worried, like I wasn't gonna um, go through school and things like that. 
And so he really wanted me to go to Unilag because he went to Unilag. Mm. Um, and I think I didn't get in the first time. And for me, that was almost leading to, you know what, I could go, there was one of my uncle that was like very big in, in computing. Like, we'll go stay with him, uh, Uncle Akin, and just like, you know, just like be with him and learn and try to grow. And, and he saw it as a way of me trying to escape going to school. <laughs> yeah, so, so going to Covenant was more like, I had to do it, like I had to. So I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wouldn't say it's completely same for me in, in, in terms of like, um, I didn't enjoy the school. I actually went through the school. I allowed right. the school to go through me as well. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't much in class because I started to come <laughs> 200 level, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but like, um, but I, I would say when I was there, I was taking it in. I didn't see it in any negative form. Mm. I was used to freedom. So most people come to college for freedom. You know, like you're now living your home and you're now being free. I had gotten all of that early enough. So I wasn't like, I wasn't looking for freedom in, 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 yeah. in principle. Um, Covenant was very good. Uh, it was very good and pretty much solidified my my entrepreneurship ideals and my perspective about life in general, yeah. What would you say was the singular best thing about going to Covenant? The concept of living a life and what I learned about it. Mm. And just like, I think Covenant, f I wouldn't, I wouldn't say much about the academic because for me that wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't. <laughs> You're not going to class. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't there for academic, right? Um, but I think in the concept of like life and living and the kind of person you are, how you see life, what you, pretty much things you figure out later. Covenant like mm. gave that early enough, um, so left school with a with a high sense of consciousness, like oh, this is what I need to do as a person. Or this is what I want to become. So I'll say that's like my main big big takeaway. Listening to Papa every day, uh, three times a week, really. Uh, I don't think he does it anymore. Uh, was was like one of my favorite moments at, at that time. Really? Yeah, yeah. Why? It's just deep. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, his his perspective about life. Obviously, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not speaking to his spiritual side of things. I'm just speaking to him as a doctor, Doctor mm. David Odeko, not like pastor, the pastor one, right? Um, his perspective about life. Obviously, I lived long, so he was, he was literally introspecting all the time he was teaching us. Mm -hmm. And just how little things he would say will pretty much just really like... And just stick. Yeah, just stick, right? Um, I remember one time in, in Covenant, there was a, a country vice president that came to visit or something like that, right? I think Gambia. And he was speaking to introduce the person, maybe to bring the person to the stage. And he said that when you're in a uni, no, so when you go to a war college, you know you're speaking to future generals. Mm. When you go to a law school, you know you're speaking to future yes. sons, right? Yeah. But when you're in front of students in a college, you don't know who you're speaking to. Mm. You can be anything, you can be anyone. And just make sure that, this was him trying to introduce the guy that was gonna talk, saying we should be attentive um, as the case is. And even though unrelated, you can be anything, you can be anyone. Like that, that particular time, that day stayed with me. Like I remember very vividly. Uh, it was October 23, 2005. Yeah. Like I can remember like, <laughs> like his voice, everything. Yeah. So I would say like listening to him was like, was a big, big part of me being in Covenant. Yeah. It's very interesting. So you started soft coming to 200 level. Yes. How? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had a roommate, Ayo Fatoko. Mm. Um, and I also had a friend, a very good friend, Okbe, and we were all in class together, I mean, studying information systems and also learning about entrepreneurship. So we came up with this idea that, you know, let's start a company, literally, mm. and we called it Yao Tech. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's really funny. So it's Yomi Ayo Okbe Tech. Okay. Yao Tech, you know. So and we're like, you know, cool, like, let's just create, it was, it was just more like fun, let's just mm. do this and, and try to see what can we build for people, right? Then, right after then, on, during the holidays, uh, I was in the bank in Abuja, Bank PHP. I remember very vividly. I went there with my brother, and I remember there was a there was a bank customer who came in. His name is Tochuko Yemiluku. I got to meet him uh, right after that time, and he was telling the bank the the teller person. I think was they were friends. They yeah. went to school together about a problem he had. Like, oh, he's trying to. He has cars. 
and he puts trackers in those cars. Mm. But because it was the early days of telco, if you don't use a SIM in two weeks, it gets bad. So if you put a SIM in a car, after two weeks, you can't find the car anymore. Right. So he was looking for a way to keep that SIM active. So it was just like banting. Um, and the, the guy, his name is Bola, uh, was also my, my own brother's friend as well. He was like, oh, I'm a yummy, he's a geek. Like, you know, they like to just call me like, oh, I'm here. Like, he's in, he's in colleges. You probably can build for you. You know how to program, right? I'm like, mm, okay, yeah. Like, I just kind of pretty much jumped on it. Yeah. And I would say that is literally the beginning of Southcom, that, that conversation. Uh, I met him the next day. He explained it in detail to me, what he was trying to do. Uh, and I went back to school. Work with the best programmer in my class at, at the time. <laughs> I know I'm not tired. And um, built out some sort of hub for him that was connected to... Uh, so at that time, you code as well? Very minimally. Okay. Nothing, not to be able to say I'm a programmer. Right. But just very minimally. It was also like a course in class. Mm. So you, you kind of like had to do it, uh, do it for... For school as well, but I know was an actual programmer. It was like a uh, it was an actual actual programmer. I think he had also gone to another uni before Covenant. So for mm. him, it was in it was just he was always building software and telling us about it. It was really like someone who inspired me a lot at that time. Um, so he built it. Uh, most of what I did was I knew at those early days that I wanted to do system design. So I didn't want to do system programming. I just wanted mm. to do design and. Uh, we even had a course in class called Des System Design, so I was I was more keen on design. Right. So it was my first opportunity to actually design something myself, mm. then tell someone to build it, build it for me. Like just yeah. don't change anything, just like build it exactly <laughs> just as I've designed it. And uh, I knew did that. Yeah. So I'll say that that meeting to Chiku is pretty much what formalized the concept of oh, you know, you can actually come, build you stuff. Can actually build stuff. Yeah. And he paid me. What was really interesting was what he paid us was my school fees then was 170k a year and it was he paid us 155k so imagine how i feel like i actually I could can't have be paid. my own father <laughs> <laughs> literally like no, I could father. Have paid my, that's, that's a bit too much yeah, but. Like, i mean i feel like you know my dad paid my fees you know and that means i could own, I, I could actually pay my fees that's, yeah that was like uh because I, I just told him he said what would what did we want I just literally picked a figure in my head because I'd asked and I knew what he wanted. I knew he wanted 50k. So I'm like, you know what, like I'm just going to say 155k. Like I didn't, <laughs> it wasn't like an articulated yeah. uh, cost plan as the case is. And he was okay with it. Um, and I remember not even believing, like, I feel like That's it's okay. too much. Yeah. Like, no, why should you pay us for, pay us that much really? Um, then, so that conversation in the bank, um, solving that problem for Chichiku, um, going through a couple of problems to solve that problem, formalize the idea of like Softcom can actually exist as a company and we can actually solve problems for people and right. solve problems for companies. So I'm curious, so at the time it was Yahoo Tech, yes. right? Um, so, but it was Anu and Chukru that kind of like solidified the idea of Softcom. Yeah. So what happened to your other partners? So Okwell left for the US right after college, after okay. Covenant. So, I mean, uh, I think he just he moved abroad because it was all it was all yeah like, just like it wasn't like really like a company it was just like mm. a bunch of boys in school um Ayo, we kind of like left uni together so did all of that together and actually started softcom together right yeah so the first when we finished uni uh, 2007 it was myself and Ayo that were our partners at, at softcom um eventually two three years later he went into politics he's actually not honorable <laughs> okay yeah uh, isn't is in a is a, is a member of the house, yeah. Um, so, but like, yeah, that's pretty much the transition here. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm still missing a part of the story, right? Um, so, after building that first thing for Tutrico, yes. and like, I can actually make money and have a company from building softwares. Yes. Um, that, was, that was still in 200 level, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and then you did another two years, and then left school, and then actually launched Softcom. So, so what was that? Th those last two yeah. years. Okay, so, because of what happened to with, with Tutrico, he was very impressed. Um, and he started introducing us to people. So he literally became a, call him a business partner. Mm. So he would call me like every other time, and you know, we're not allowed to use phones in school, but I, I had a phone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so he would, like leave a message for me and say, oh, you know, Yomi, you need to come and see me in Abuja. There's someone. So we started doing things for different people, but it was his circle of friends. Mm. Um, some guy has a company, wants to automate how they work. Somebody wants to build an intranet. So it was pretty much just things for, 
Tochiko and Tochiko's friends. Right, so just gigs. Gigs, right. Um, but also, at that time, I started to think about, so what products do you build? Because it was, it was strenuous, uh, mm. even that, that early, having to have multiple clients and things like that, right? And we were just students. We didn't really know much about organizing. And we are still at school mm. as well. So I'd say between 2005 and 2007, uh, pretty much spent time building various things for to to our friends and, and to <laughs> friends. Um, yeah, and they paid us a lot. I think the next person to introduce introduce us to you paid us 700 k. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like it was it was um yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was nice. It was, okay, it was so at what, at what point did it then really formalize and it actually became soft calm? And what were the very early days of, oh, we're out of school, one only like just hustling, like I want to actually build a company. And what was the company supposed to be doing at that time? Because now we have a lot of products, but like those early days. Yes. Okay. Um, so finishing college, finishing uni, really, um, I already knew that I wanted to solve problems mm. because I... I derived so much joy from seeing Tochuku's joy. <laughs> like literally, like I think that's a simple way to put it. Like I just knew that, wow, this is stuff that I wanted to do every day. So even if you didn't pay me for it, like I just would love to be in a place where uh, I could use seemingly magical skills. Because they're not skills everybody, Yeah. I mean, not everybody could, could, could program or build, right? To resolve things you can see. Mm. Like so I can bring things from the unseen world at least when it comes to even, and help them resolve day-to-day -day challenges as the case is. Um, so, going to NYC, I think NYC was like the action, going to NYC, um, got a call again from Tuchiku. I was like, oh, Yomi, what are you gonna do after college? Like, um, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna try to figure it out, possibly get a job. I didn't think that I would okay. not like have a job because I didn't. There was no way I was gonna end. Like so, mm -hmm. I'll have a job then. And you build on the side. I'll build on the side, and I, I assumed that at some point, you know, I kind of like. Just <laughs> yeah, I just. Um, but I was like, oh, are you sure you want to do that? Long and short, he gave me fifteen million, literally. Yeah. Wow, I need it to in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally, he gave me fifteen million. Myself and I, and I was like, you know what, you guys should make sure that. Whatever it is you do, don't get distracted by that rat race. Because mm. once you start, it's hard. There's no, there's hardly a way out. Mm. Um, and he, he was like, "This is the opportunity he had." I think he went to. And fifteen million then was fifteen million. It's not like it's actually <laughs> like maybe one fifty million now. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, give us fifteen M. Um, obviously, got some stake in the company. Yeah. Uh, for Daima and his own partner, uh, his partner was Uche Uche Ophili. Um, so both of them pretty much offered us mentorship. Um, they financed the company in, in principle um, and made us get comfortable with the idea of we don't have to always get things right. Hmm. Like, like, cause we were, I mean, I was, it was the first time someone was giving me money that, so I was a bit like, you know, like we need to make sure this works, that type yeah. of pressure, right? And when things, cause it was early days of tech, when things were, we're not necessarily working or maybe timelines were not as we described them. They never, what I expected wasn't what I got from them. And that really, really solidified me. Mm. It was more understanding, oh, are you serious? Oh, let's try it out again. Oh, go talk to this person. Oh, let me try to figure it out. And um, yeah, both of them like pretty much solidified softcom. Um, we worked on Real Energy, the first product, put our time online. Right. Um, worked on payment, like put payment into, because people couldn't buy online. Um, banks were blocking cards, too much fraud. There was no MasterCard or Visa card at, at the time. Mm. Um, so we decided to build our own payment engine so people can buy on our own e-commerce platform. Right. Uh, so it was mostly just for that for that purpose. Um, but as people putting money into the wallet at the time, and they were going to pay cash in the bank, by the way, they walk into a bank, pay cash, <laughs> send us a teller, then we'll fund the account for them, right? And we saw about 11,000 people do that. And that like struck like a in chord. 20, 2007. 2008 now, now. 2008 now. Um, that struck a chord like, wow. And when we interacted with people, we saw they did it more for just love for the product. Because mm. why do you want to go take money you have, um, jump everybody on the street you can buy airtime from, go then put the in bank. an account, then now try to buy online. You know, it was mm. just tedious, right? Mm. But I think everybody, there was, there was a lot of, Consumers, and I, I, some of them I probably still 
I remember their names. A lot of people who just love the idea of that we were imagining to a commerce world mm. and young people were like trying it out. Just similar to the same like, yeah. um, I would say frenzy we have today. So it was the same then. They were like, especially people in corporate, like people working in Shell, Chevron, they would typically buy from us. They would email us sometimes just to say, man, we like what you guys are doing. If you need any help, you know, yeah. uh, get in touch. Yeah. So that's what that, those early times were. Um, I met Ezra, I think, shall I introduce him to Ezra actually? I met Ezra looking to build stuff for the web. The first right. thing he built was offline. Mm. Um, but now to build for the web, I realized that, wow, I know couldn't build for the web. <laughs> um, and so I met Ezra um, to try to build something for the web. What we worked on together, the first thing we worked on together, we actually didn't launch it. We just tried to like, but he helped us build some sort of like working relationship. I was in uni, he was working in Lagos. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was, um, I think he was working in a company, I, I don't recall the name. Probably Delivery Science or something. No, I was like before. later, later, Job later. Man. No. Ah. Yeah, this, this, this is like, that's like later, later, later. <laughs> so, um, I, was, I know it was my final year, it was doing his NYSE. Right. Yeah, it was not, we're doing his NYSE in a company in Lagos. So when we got the 15M, like after college, I just called him like, oh, Ezra, um, we have capital now. Uh, we can actually go build things. So, so he was you guys' first employee? Literally, yeah, <laughs> he was, he was. And we all just moved into this house in Allen, about seven of us, and began the journey of attempting to build for the internet. Um, something that was obvious then was instantaneousness. Mm. Things that couldn't happen, that you had to wait for everything. To buy airtime, you go to airtime. You take, like mm. what you do right now on the phone was you had to go to it. You wanted to send money, it was, it was pretty much also like next day. Um, you wanted to order for anything, you have to wait for the shops to open, right? So we knew that ins we can bring instantaneousness into our ecosystem, into like the lives of people within our environment. And we picked airtime as the first as the first thing to work on. So making airtime available in a way you can buy it anytime or online or was pretty much what I would say was our first was our first uh, baby because <laughs> all of us like just murdered it and kind of like worked together. And, as as like a, as a family, uh, really, um, yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about like key milestones, right? Um, graduating and getting investment from Tojiko was definitely a key milestone. Hiring Ezra sounds like it was a key milestone. Yes. Working on the airtime products was a key milestone. What other key milestones in thin, say between 2007 and maybe 2012, like that first five yeah. years, what were the key ones that yeah. so when you look back and like, this happened and it took us forward, this one happened and it took yeah. us forward? Um, so, seeing the behavior of people from wallet, we knew that we could extend that wallet to third parties. Mm -hmm. So even though it was working predominantly in our own product, we could extract it. So it was called, the product was called ReloadNG.com. And when you log in, you now have something called a soft boss. That was a wallet name inside of the product. Right. So you're like, you know what, we can extract soft boss and bring it out and call it softboss.com. Um, built around Intercept's web pay uh, at the time, which was the only thing available, um, and attempted to expose it to merchants. And we, we got it going. We got it going to hundreds of merchants, right? Um, and as we got it going, we knew that the margins, which was the problem with low as well, was too yeah. small, and we can't we can pretty much run from the margins, so we needed yeah. some sort of capital. Um, began some, so another key milestone was talking to Tayo Adere Yoko. Uh, it was a former GTV MD. Um, I mean, it did say we were t we were having conversation and we we're going to invest one million dollars. <laughs> yeah, that was like 2000 and 2009 years or, or so. Yeah, around then. Um, and I think he had some L challenge, uh, which pretty much eventually he, he died. Right. So like that conversation died with him. Mm. Yeah, and that was like. That was a downer. That was like uh, that was a that was a real downer. Uh, that's when everybody kind of like had to some way move on. Ezra went to Jobberman, so that's mm, when all this started. Right. Ezra went to Jobberman. Uh, Jobberman had, had um, maybe a year after had raised some capital, started Jobberman, so he went to become their CTO. Um, so at this time, the the product reload engine was not enough to finance the company, so they needed to be external funding, but yes. that didn't come true. Yes, then, right. then we now started doing client work. 
Because mm. we, when we left Covenant, we didn't, we were not going to do any client work anymore. You're just building your own building products. Our own products, right? right? And the Reload Energy was that product for us, right? And all of a sudden, we're now back to you know what? We can use our skills to generate money. Mm. In case even if you can get capital, because this company is alive. And yeah. that just grew and grew and grew. And and if you know if you work on like client projects, they hardly ever finish. <laughs> you know, you want this, someone wants a new addition or some kind of like support requirements. And we now found ourselves in what I'll call a, t- a toggle of minds. Mm. So uh, mind share for the product, which is really what we want, want to, to do. do. Um, but we don't have money. Mm-hmm. So we need to kind of like serve these customers and try to get money from them. And we kind of like moved in between these two things, both in how we allocated our time, mm. um, the, the, the work people in the company did. So someone, for example, may have been working on a product mm. and had to pause to go and try to like solve, some, uh, solve something as cases. So those early days, um, we saw client service in itself as a means of like solving a capital problem. Mm. Um, we got and it was easy to get the clients at that time? Um, I, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it wasn't hard. Hmm. Um, it wasn't hard because... Okay, so Reload NG was like a signboard for us. Hmm. Anywhere we went to, we were someone like, oh, you guys did that thing. Right. So by so design... there was a solid proof of work. Yeah, there was a solid proof of work. So by design, people didn't ask us questions. Hmm. Our first customer then like after and i'm not saying college time like course of come time was mtn yeah like mtn like literally told us to build something for them six for 16m right yeah that solves it for your problem yeah, immediately yeah so, yeah so like i mean and they were going to do other things they, they, so we kind of we kind of like kept on building different things for them solving different things for them um then shell uh and energy rather not shell and energy uh also build something for them but in all of these occurrences, everyone they had seen something on Reload Energy. Reload Energy was why they came to us. Mm. Or when we showed interest, once we said Reload Energy, like, like, you know, it has to be you guys, um, as, as the case is. So I wouldn't say it was hard. Uh, I don't want to underestimate any challenge anyone may have gone through yeah. acquiring customers. But I think Reload Energy just pretty much cracked that for us. Mm. And also pretty much now formed the culture of how we approach client service. Mm. Um, we chose our customers. We don't, we didn't necessarily, you wouldn't find us like, oh, we're chasing this customer, we have this customer where, we, we never had sales teams. Sales teams were like, it was more like going to the room, explain it to someone and um, walk through that process and get to the end. Mm. Um, and um, yeah. yeah like, That's, really how did good. you guys find your way? I mean, you know, you said you ended up shuffling between the internal product and client product. Yeah. Um, is that, are you still shuffling now, or is there more focus now on actual product, the client product? And how has that transition, sort of transition happened? Yeah, um, we actually set a timeline, and the timeline was 2015. Okay. It was like, you know, we're going to get to this point and just decommission this client service uh, uh, division or side of our business mm. and now focus solely on our products. Mm. Um, so it was going to be how many years? When did Ezra leave, for instance? Um, Ezra left to Jobber Man. Came back after six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember like him calling me and saying, like, oh, Yomi, like, I don't think I'm working here anymore. <laughs> so really, then we met up at Ikeja Mall and just picked up, we picked up another subject. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. We picked up another subject. We picked up field force, field force management. Like, how do... At the time, the GSM module had come out. By right. the way, technology improvements were the, were the major milestones for how our work transitioned. Mm. Um, before the GSM module on the phone, you couldn't pick, you couldn't like call an address on the, from a mobile phone. So even Google Maps wouldn't have existed without that right. GSM, um, the location module coming to the mobile phone. So when that happened, um, one of the execs at MTN had been describing a problem they had. They talked to us a lot about their problems, right? Mm. And the problem was more like, how do I tell if my guys actually do work on the field? Um, they had sales guys on the field, but because their products were essential items, whether a salesman went to the store or not, someone would buy an MTN card. Right. So they couldn't tell at that at revenue, but they wanted to, they, they knew that if they improve the efficiency of their salespeople, it could lead to them. revenue progress. 
Um, so we picked up that problem and tried to build, try to build a product for it. Um, field, a field force management product, still there, Field Max Pro. Serves a couple of companies today, became independent, all of us left it and it's still running, <laughs> it's still there. Um, and spent, I would say we spent maybe another two, three years doing that together. Mm. Yeah, um, then um, still, while doing that, trying to go back to like, oh, we kind of like need to build a product. Products, right. But in this, in, while doing that, uh, it, was a, it was a combination of client services and products. So we're not building it for each customer. We wanted to mm. standardize it in a way that we could give it to everyone. Um, so I see things of work back and forth. Ezra worked from, with us from like maybe 2007 to about maybe 2014, maybe seven years. Mm. Um, took, I think it took two, two breaks, <laughs> a six months break. Uh, then I think it took another break when it went to Abuja, maybe a year break. Mm. So maybe in, in those seven years, maybe one and a half years. Right, um, that it, makes sense. So you months. said, so it was maybe like around 2012? That you decided, oh, let's do client service to boost revenue because our products were not working. No, it was a lot earlier than that. Was, it right. was a lot earlier than that. Okay. Um, I think around 2010. -ish. 2010, okay. Yeah, around 2010. Um, but we, like, to just come back to the question you were asking, we decided that we we're going to end it in 2015, but we mm -hmm. couldn't. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't. Like, we had long running contracts. So some of our contracts were like five year contracts. Mm. And the the one the the 2015 was when the last one was gonna expire, and the customer came back and said oh, they wanted to extend it by another three years, um, and it was a case of hmm, this is revenue, we need this revenue, right? At least let's learn from our past, right? Let's not yeah. immediately really turn away from revenue yeah. because we still need the money, and that pretty much just kept us on and kept us on till about 2019. Mm. So 2019 brought it to a complete close. The, the client service division. Um, however, I would say it's the best thing that happened to us. Why? Because we learned everything we needed to learn about business mm. and also learned about discovering problems and about solving problems with science. Because as you can imagine, most corporates have big budgets to try out things, yeah. to do things, right? So if we're not trying to figure out how do you know where sales, are, sales rep are on the field, we're trying to figure out how do we tell the impact of marketing on revenue mm. and do that with tech? Mm. Um, and we're doing that across industries. Mm. And that really, really pretty much really enriched uh, our entire knowledge base on what are the problems people have. Um, it meant that we're also interacting with different layers of customers. We're interacting with consumers because we're solving problems for consumer goods companies. Mm. And that's, that would sometimes put us with their retailers or, right. or, their, or their customers. Um, I would say it's the journey that pretty much taught us everything we need to do forward, mm. usually. Um, we discovered the, the common problems people were facing. Uh, we, we saw how large companies think about monetization mm. uh, and how they think about even putting a product in the market. Like what leads to those decisions? Like how do you arrive at um, a problem and how do you arrive at solving it as, as the case is? Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So in 2019, when you closed the client service business, um, what, what happened next, right? Cause like, so I know close, but then how did you transition towards like products like AU and stuff? Those are the products that are now, yes. okay, what you're completely focused on, no longer clients. But I mean, obviously probably you had like a client service team. So in terms of like the team structure, the approach to building, mm -hmm. what, what was that transition like? Um, in the journey towards getting to that moment, we had come to, I would say, some realization mm. around problems that were common to everyone in our society. Um, and or needs that we thought that people had that will always be there no matter what year we were, were in. Mm. How those needs were met may, may change and evolve, but right? And that? so it was like, first the need to, to identify people. Uh, and they need to like have an identity and to say, okay, this is the person I'm dealing with. And you find that, we found that common in almost all the things we did, there was always this need to digitally verify a person. Mm. Um, when you're done giving a person an identity, one common need will also be knowledge. Because mm. it's from knowledge you create value, right? So they need to know, mm. right? Um, when you're also done acquiring knowledge, you want to apply it to value creation. So they need to exchange value. Mm. 
And when you're done exchanging value, um, your measure of progress comes from growth. So they need to grow. So this sequential needs, um, we spend some time, a couple of, a couple of, uh, a couple of months, about, about six or nine months, like looking closely at these problems and how they affected human lives yeah. and were disablers of progress. Like right. they were barriers to progress. So they need to grow to exchange value. They need um, to be known. To be known. An ID. An ID. Okay. They need to know. To know, know they value need to, exchange. To exchange value. And to grow. And they need to grow. Like these needs are consistent in literally every human being's life. Yeah. Um, so transition was easy because that's what we're going to transit into. Mm. But in transitioning into so that, to solve problems across these four areas. Yes, because right. we also saw that they were connected. Mm. So if our real desire was to see people progress, or you know, I did explain to you that like just seeing Tochuku's joy like brought me joy, and if I wanted to interpret that in the consumer world, it's progress. Mm. People, people progressing. Um, somebody sending money on a platform, for example, is not enough for me. Like, mm. actually seeing that, oh, this person is actually progressing, um, was kind of like what, what I would say, what we're solving for as, as a group of people. Um, and we saw that these needs were connected. So even if you solve an identity problem, and uh, you make sure people could become easily verified online and possibly um, gain access to knowledge, um, they, they didn't feel growth until these four things mm. were in sync. So um, we set up a lab uh, at the time. We set up a lab. Uh, brought in Tommy. Uh, Tommy came to join us. I think I was, I was the head of innovation. Yes, Tommy Amao came to join us at that time, um, and we just took an experimental mindset mm. to these four things. So I, it was always funny to me when people would say, "Why are you guys working on? Like, come here, working? We're we're not working on anything. We're just in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we were just like we were not." We're not particular about the output. We just wanted to really discover how mm. these needs were inter interconnected to themselves. And more importantly, what were like the ways we could remove the barriers in between those needs individually, but more importantly, how they connect with themselves. Mm. So, um, and we did, we did some trials in ID, uh, did some trials in, um, in the need to know. The need to know was two-pronged, two where there was knowledge, and there was data. Mm. Like, how do you learn from knowledge? And how do you, like, how do you acquire knowledge? And how do you make meaning out of data? So we mm. spent some time also looking into data. Um, spent some time as well looking into payment. So we went to get licenses. Like, oh, let's try things out. Um, and um, are there ways to get payment moving faster? Um, are there ways to get payment uh, enabling progress faster? So we just spent some time looking at those needs. Um, in between all of that, in another distraction came. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the distraction was was a very attractive one because everything we had been experimenting, the distraction gave us an opportunity to test it at scale. Like, what would it look like? They were not products to us. They were just more like experiments, experiments right? Um, and we did work with the Bank of Industry. Was uh, that the distraction? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, like, you know, uh, we did work with the Bank of Industry to try out literally every single component of our experiment. Um, and went from that, I mean, cause you, you go through a journey of defocusing, mm. right? Um, went through, through, through like, okay, so what part of this need could be singular that could lead to like our future? That mm. could lead to a future of innovation for the company, but also um, achieving what seems to be important to us, which is enabling progress for people. And what we found was money, right? We didn't, we didn't, we didn't go to money. We we mm. we, we like got there. we got there. Yeah. Mm. Um, which I all found was money that. So, for example, at identity, um, you could be you could be Igbo, you could be Yoruba, you could be Aosa, um, and you could have biases and, and peculiarities and things like that are right. But money was a was a tribe that uniformed people. Mm. It didn't really matter whether you were Igbo or Aosa. When it comes to money, people agreed. They agreed a little bit more clear, clearly. Um, they need to know. Um, we also came to a realization that education itself is wrongly structured. Mm. You learn everything else, but everything you need. <laughs> you, you learn how to like write programs, or you learn how to be an artist, or uh, how to create any, any um, whether you're in, in science or you're in art or you're in commercial, right? But you don't learn about life. 
Mm. You don't learn about managing money, for example. You don't even learn about the value of money. Mm. So we also knew that, hmm, like they need to know. We could actually like deepen it on, on money. Mm. Um, they need to use data as a means to to to, to know make more, sense of things. To make sense of things was also most available at money. Yeah. There was no other there's no other system, at least in our in our own environment, that is as advanced as payment that gives you tons of data you can big data you can play with to try to interpret things and try to give people um, insight and things like that right so then they need to exchange value right then <laughs> uh, they need to grow it was mostly measured at money mm. um, we may not we may, you may you may we may have variances as to how we perceive money but there's something that is true you measure progress a lot with money uh, what you're paid if you're in a working professional how much you earn um, and all of that even is not even about the money. It's about the quality of your life. Your life yeah. yeah um, your ability to really be whole as a person. Um, money has a huge impact on that. So we eventually got to money as addressing mm. all those needs together. Um, so paying people on a phone number, for example, is about the need to to identify a person mm. and to do so in the fastest way possible. Um, One forty million people have phone numbers in Nigeria. All right. So you can get money moving faster. You can get them connected to themselves faster. Um, and I could go on, I could go into so a- So AOO was the, pro, was the result of this month spent on identifying the four core values, the experiment or the distraction with Bank of Industry and saying, okay, you know what, what solves all our problems yes. and helps us achieve our mission is money. And the first iteration was like, how do we begin to build AOO to yes. do all of that? Yes, yes. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm curious about something. So remember when you first started working on Reload or NG yes. um, and it was product? And then there was no revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And you needed to either get investment or client service. Mm -hmm. Now, backtrack to 2019, and you have closed down client service, which is revenue generating business, yes. and go back to experiment it. And you said at that time, you guys were not building anything, you were just experimenting for a long time. Yes. How did you fund that process? Yeah, that process. Did you eventually raise money, mm -hmm. or was it just all the revenue? Yeah, I mean, it was a combination of both, um, but not, maybe not in the convention of raise money. As you as you think about it in, in tech, so we had we had generated revenue from client service, so mm -hmm. direct translation of money money um, money end into like our experiments. Mm -hmm. We because of how we built and how we chose our customers, people paid us a premium on the work we did. Mm -hmm. It was it wasn't necessarily time to work. Mm -hmm. We were we will oftentimes be with the customer just trying to figure things out. Oh, change it again. Like, it doesn't really work well that way. Um, Right, so we had we had hand every money we earned we were transitioning into our experiment. We also wanted to raise capital, actually, like go to a VZ raise capital. Um, but in my early interactions, I could tell that um, we didn't have a problem of product yet. We mm. still wanted to be fluid, mm. and people wanted us to so, um, just come, like we, we, have I, a little pitch. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just wanted I wanted the fluidity of a researcher, like just looking at things and eventually landing at uh, where you want it. So just pretty much raise, I would say, raise money capital from our friends. Don't you yeah. give us money again, actually? <laughs> Literally, yeah. Um, and so got in some funding, but not necessarily like uh, VC funding. Got in funding from like family, yeah. friends, people we had built relationships with over time uh, to try to fund that, that entire period, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. In this, up until you launched AO, what would you say with the biggest mistakes that you made that if you were to start afresh, yeah. you're like, yeah, we won't do this, maybe top two th and three things. But also what were like the biggest lessons? Like it could be from the mistakes, or it could just be like, oh, it was also like for me success that I learned this very core cool thing. I think one, hmm, couple of things. <laughs> um, solving a problem and like being committed to solving that problem is really good. Uh, I mean, it kind of like grinds you and wants you to, wants you, keeps you going as, as the case is. But it's also very important to know the market size of the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. Um, no matter how far you go on some things, there's just no market size there'll, for it. There'll be a cap. There'll just be a cap. There'll be, there's no, the opportunity may not be necessarily equal to even the effort or investments you're making. And you need to know that early, not, not get there and like realize that, oh, I mean, nobody's not going to, I think understanding the market deeper will have been something to, uh, uh, to think about. Um, so and where did this lesson come from? Which of the product or what points in the journey did you like, uh, I wish we knew like the market size was not big enough? 
Hmm. Because he was always a set of connected things, uh, I wouldn't say about a product, but I can mm. say about the moment. Mm. Um, and I would say it's more from like 2012, yeah, around that time. And just realizing that even though we're spending time around payments uh, at the time, 2011, spending time around payments, um, the reality of our market at the time, there was just no way. There were, the infrastructure that was in place couldn't lead to the scale we're imagining, even mm. though like we wanted to really uh, do much do in, in that space. So I say that time. It's come up again, because sometimes you don't learn a lesson once. Yeah. You, sure. you need to learn it a couple of times before it sticks. before it sticks as the case is. It's come up a couple of times, but that was like the beginning of that deep sense of consciousness. Um, I think it was easy before then for me to say capital was the problem, mm. or to say people were the problem or something. But I think at that time, um, there was a realization that it's not just enough capital, it's not just about capital or talent. The market itself and its current situation didn't align with, mm. with the realities of what we were, what we were doing. And that's not a problem, by the way. You could also wait for the market. Mm. The market can meet you somewhere on the way, right? But you just must have money. You must have capital. You can't be in that situation and not have I capital. I have, yeah, because how, how would you last? How would you last? And yeah. that was really the problem that I, I, yeah. I think I came to a conclusion on. Everything we try to do then has become numb now. So the market eventually got there. But we just but didn't, we just have, didn't have enough away. capital to like, to like, uh, old, old. and it's good to not wish that away to like, I mean, even when you're young, like you, you, you gain confidence from like, you're bonded with your group of guys working together. You guys will, will get past any barrier. It's good to not wish that away, to really like, be more logical about that than, than emotional. Um, so I'll say that's one. Okay. Um, what else would I do differently? It would be mostly like, I mean, this combination of things, I feel like because I wanted to be involved in both, I think it was more That's me. That's client service and product. Yeah, it was more me because the company could actually have a client service company running itself, mm -hmm. have its own CEO, like, and I didn't need to be in there. I right? used to be having revenue and... Uh, yes, and be doing what we're doing. But because I wanted to be in there, right, and once I'm done collecting revenue, I'm going. I, 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 in, a, in a typical year, we'll probably work on two projects. It was really about get capital to go do this, mm. right? So I think I'll have done that separation a lot more. Like, mm. uh, we also didn't need. Is there a future where you see the client service coming back and have it different? Yeah, I, I think the future is here already. I've, I've like gained my freedom. <laughs> yeah, so like, um, I've gained my freedom. I'm saying yeah for the first time. I'm gonna like have to leave Softcom at some point. Yeah, and just like focus solely on AO because mm. that is what allows us achieve our mission. Mm. Yeah, allows us to achieve our mission, yeah. So, but as I see a world where Softcom will like, you know, may possibly take infrastructure from society or infrastructure that's available around and try to solve varying problems. I also think we can't afford to lose our labs. Mm. Our labs is our power. We find out things we don't find in the market or in research. Mm. Um, yeah, so I see a world where that would be. Thanks, yeah. so we're going back to the, to the lessons and slash mistakes. So the first one was, um, find the find the market size first, right? And know if you have the runway to wait for it or find something else that has a much um, larger market size. Mm -hmm. And the second one was um, a world where you don't necessarily have to be involved in every aspect and yes. choose one and maybe then both of them can actually grow. Yes. Do, yes. do you have another one? Yes, um, another one would be... Um, the wait time. Yeah. The wait time. Uh, I need it. I, I, I'm a, I, like, I like to be convinced. I like conviction. And I want to be sure that before I'm running, I'm stable. Um, I would say that doing both together might, is actually not a bad idea. Yeah. Trying to go forward fast, maybe not so fast, or whatever speed that is adequate for you as a person or a company, um, while trying to get, get answers. I would love to, as a person, gain clarity first before mm -hmm. I run and I could take my time in in trying to do <laughs> in trying to do that um I'm personalizing it because I feel like it is somewhat rubbed off on the company right yeah I, I was okay without revenue I, I wasn't I was never bothered about oh we don't have revenue we we'll make money like those mm -hmm. things didn't work they didn't like disturb me so much what was always more on my mind was like I need to be clear Mm. And because I need to be clear, or it needs to be right, mm. and it needs to be clear and right together, right? 
I wanted the things to be as slow as possible. Mm. Um, so I would say that if I was gonna like uh, look back and, and figure like how do you do this again, and it would be more to keep going while learning. Mm. Uh, so don't wait too much for the perfect time or the clarity. Yeah, but there's, there's really no perfect time. How it comes time. to doing, do it. Yes, and get it. it's a journey of continuous clarity, really. Mm. And that that continuous clarity doesn't need to happen to doesn't need to happen by you staying mm. where you are. Mm. You can you can find that clarity on the on the go uh, as as the case is. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. One of the things I've learned from your journey so far is people, right? Yeah. You talk about I mean the Yao Tech and yeah. your group of guys. Then you talk about meeting to Chuku and then meeting Ayo and then building together and then hiring Ezra. And then in 2019, when you were transitioning into like doing more product work, yeah. you talk about bringing to me as well. Um, and it's Tuchuku who has kind of been in your journey so far. And there was Tai as well that you met that almost invested. And it just feels like people have played a large part in like the milestones that mm -hmm. you see as milestones. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm wondering like how you approach relationships, right? Mm -hmm. For instance, to meet Tuchuku when you're in 20 level and he's still with you guys now or still investing like that's a long-term yeah. relationship yeah. so I, i'm not sure if the question is clear but i'm just really like curious about how you've met people like how do you first of all even identify the right people for instance how did you know oh i think ezra will be cool to work with i think tommy will be good to work with how do yeah. i know the investors to talk to how do i just mm -hmm. carry my partnerships around mm -hmm. yeah um peace i think the, the first thing to say is that at, at those times i didn't know those things is now looking back They're like, like oh I'm really connected i'm connecting the yeah. door. and i think the first key conclusion looking back is like growth in itself is a function of how you navigate three key things yeah. uh, people knowledge and habits hmm. there is people, no way you can grow if you don't navigate people uh, or you don't have to you you can like grow through the people you meet the people you spend time with the the people you interact with they kind of like rub off on you right um, knowledge is also very important. You can't be in a, a field or a problem and not attempt to gain more clarity, more competence in, in that area. And more, even more important is habit. The things you do recurrently, the things you don't do. Um, I think looking back, that's some, some sort of clarity that I've gained as a person. Um, in relation to people, I, I always, always know, like, um, this is a word because um, I could literally tell a person's energy when, when I first meet them, when I'm interacting with them. I could tell, um, and I've been wrong sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that there's no time where I haven't gained from just interacting with people or like connecting with people. Um, how do I deal with relationships with people? I would say I've gotten better. I wasn't the best at it. What I was good more at is was like I was always my conscience was always clear my intentions were always like cool. So if for example things were not going the way I wanted it to go, you would see it in my mood with the person. Mm. I couldn't like uh, mask my 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 feelings from my relationship with the person uh, as as the case is. But I think over time I've gotten I've gotten better. At like you know. Sometimes things don't go the way you want them to go, but it doesn't mean that you guys have to be at odds with each mm. other. Um, but to speak to what you're saying, like people pretty much have enabled our progress. I could literally tell a person at, at every point in time who pretty much added to uh, us gaining better clarity or even us, us progressing uh, as, as the case is. That makes sense. I feel like this thing's been like one hour, so I'll try to round up, but I have no, so, I mean, so many funny. questions. Please, please. Um, one of the things that strikes me whenever I think about the soft comp story is how sort of like different has been from all the other tech companies, popular tech companies that we know, right? Mm -hmm. And learning about your journey, once to understand like, oh yes, this is where we're focused on this thing. This is why we didn't rush into building products immediately. But I'm wondering just like as a person, as, as a CEO, right? Just mm -hmm. seeing other companies like Playstack, Flutter, have come in 2015 and you've been trying to do this since like 20, 2009. Yeah. Like, yeah. How have you managed to just like, oh, this is where we are, the companies that we're trying to do and not trying to compete or get distracted and just sort of focus on, because you're on your own lane, right? Yeah. And how has that been possible? Um, I think when it started, it was very, I was very happy to see like things emerge, but I'll get into conversations and people will ask me this a lot. So I'll now start thinking like, oh, really? Is this something I'm meant to be feeling? Mm -hmm. Like literally it was getting me to like, 
or is this something I'm meant to be feeling? Um, but I would say that how we manage to maintain our, our power to, I think it's more just realizing that there are fundamental things that don't change, mm -hmm. even though we live in a world that's constantly changing. Um, we spoke, we just spoke about some needs. Yeah. Uh, think about 20 years ago, we pretty much exchanged cash with ourselves. We are now pretty much exchanging digital payments and, and, when, and thinking about a world of crypto and things like that. But it's still the intrinsic need we're addressing, mm. value exchange. So there are things that don't change. And the reality is that those things, there will always be the need to make them better. So there will always be an opportunity to solve yes, this problem. There's always be a need to make them better. The reality is most companies, you, the companies you described, built in a world of card infrastructure. So like cards showed up and they were now means to store value somewhere else and be a gateway and exchange value. But that infrastructure wouldn't be there five years time or 10 years time, mm. right? There'll be a new infrastructure that would govern how people interact with themselves. Mm. Um, obviously I expect those companies to keep evolving, uh, but there will always be opportunity for better really. Mm. I think that's the first thing to say. Uh, another thing that I think I've found as what will not change is a human's desire for growth, mm. for more. Um, we, we were joking about the iPhone when we go here, right? Like, and we talk about the iPhone 10 or the <laughs> and your small iPhone and my 6. Small phone, iPhone 6 right here. And, and think about what the iPhone felt like at that time that I got that one. Mm. It was the end for me. Mm. Like, but think about how it feels like now at 10. And we know that there's a 16 coming. <laughs> so. We don't know there's a 16 coming. So sometimes you ruffle yourself up about what is going on next to you, but you also should think about what wouldn't change and how do you build character, competence, and relationships that would ensure that those things that don't change, you keep, you keep engaging with them and mm. you, keep, you keep growing with them. Um, so I would say for me, that's pretty much where we are. I also think that the world is about to turn, mm. literally. Um, I know Web 1, Web 2, Web 3 ideas are, sometimes they sound geeky, but they are not geeky things. They are actual realities. The last set of companies that are leading, our, leading the world, whether it's the Googles or Facebooks, pretty much built on read and write, mm -hmm. right? Um, they gave us more abilities to write on the internet, to like contribute to what is, what is there. Um, and that has led to a lot of more questions that should, should we just read and write in that environment? It's led to questions about ownership, ownership of what I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm writing, for example, on Instagram, but Instagram is monetizing that, right? And I don't gain any value from, from contributing to that yeah. environment, right? And I'm asking myself, I can. It's because of my contribution that this, this platform is growing. So I think the world itself would evolve to um, new opportunities. Uh, let me say Web3 web as, as one example. Two is also like the advancement in science. Um, think about healthcare. I mean, healthcare has been there for hundreds of years. Uh, there's still, people still go into the hospital for very basic things that, I mean, think about how many times a doctor has treated a malaria patient, mm. like possibly a million times, right? But he's still gonna meet a malaria patient tomorrow morning. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of data set about malaria that you can use as a means of addressing that problem or solving that problem. So I think the world in itself will leverage on all of these advancements to get us into a newer world. And I don't, see, I don't think what is enabling today is what we would drive tomorrow, mm. personally. Um, yeah, I think... So just knowing that there's always going to be problems and opportunities in the future yeah. helps with that centered. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say you're most proud of? People. Just like... You know, like, seeing... And I, I, maybe I cannot relate with the joy of a parent. You, know, you have a baby, <laughs> and all of a sudden, I mean, the person has now bought a car or rented a house, or they're now independent, and you, and you saw them fall down. You saw them mess themselves up, right? So just being there, or having the opportunity to be there, really, at the point where people are at their early stages, they're still forming themselves. I mean, I'm so proud of Ezra, like, <laughs> you know, like, it's such a, such a, uh, such a great, great person. And knowing and seeing his journey, like, um, and I can say that about tons of people. Um, and he also for that kind of like, makes me believe in people. Mm. Because, 
I mean, a person could be at a state and they could look like, oh, this state is who they are or, they are, they, or whatever things they were struggling with at that time could be how you perceive them. Then a couple of years later, you see how the person has grown from that point to to more, to progress, right? Um, so I say people is what I say I'm most proud of. Um, yeah. Is there any question that I didn't ask you but you that wanted me to? Or is that a part of your story that we somehow didn't touch and you wanted to talk about it? Um, maybe Shandy, but my partner should be Shandy. Okay. Um, I think that we started to work together from as early as 2009. He had his own company mm. and we just had interactions. And before then, I, I told you I had partners from school um, when things didn't really work, everybody just like went their ways. But meeting Shendi pretty much solidified, completed me as a person mm. in the context of like solving problems mm. or trying to build a company. All of a sudden, I felt that this person complimented me so deeply and we could do magic together. And year in, year out, we've gone through um, discovering these problems together. We've gone through... Um, building together we've gone to even envisioning the future together um, and i would say his person uh and what his abilities in the company and just working with him as a person um, is one of the reasons why i believe in a in a better future mm. not just for the company but for people mm. that you could like find you could you could find form with a person and that could really lead to unimaginable growth so now our entire goal as as two two of us is to automate that mm. like how do you put that in software because <laughs> yeah because human, human emotion is hard like it dealing is. with you is hard like you know it sometimes is. you feel like sometimes you don't feel like but software is software it's input and output right so if and we're doing that first in money <laughs> yeah we're doing for that first in money i think the next set of how you evolve as a product will be solidifying even the concept of like how do you grow together mm. um and and how do you grow together could even be as basic as being able to learn from your actions it doesn't mean we're doing things together mm. like how do i learn so from your back own back to even the data yeah back to even to, to data as, as the cases um i think that's like i think shende is like my partner of potential <laughs> literally like i think i'm as well i think i am as well and that was a, a key moment of my. So I need to trick one. I need to share day. This yeah. recipe for success. Okay. <laughs> Noted. Uh, my final question. Yeah. So I've learned a lot about, and I think everybody watching has learned a lot about the behind the scene of Softcom, right? Yeah. Which is which is why I like these interviews because it's not just really about the things that we see on the internet. It's like a bit about the thought process that you guys have gone through and just getting to where you are. Um, but it's also a lot of content. So if there's one thing. Or maybe two that you want people to remember from listening and watching your story mm. what would it be um life's journey is not linear and the non-linearity of your life or whatever challenges you're going through as a person uh, shouldn't be how you define yourself you're not what you're doing you're not what is happening to you you're just really who you are and you will always have opportunity to aim for better and aim for growth as the case is um, and that, that's very evident in how we have like yeah. navigated, navigated that. And sometimes we felt that we were dead, right? Hmm. And as, as the case is. Um, the second thing is more along the lines of like growth in itself. Sometimes we can, we can get selfish in desire for it. Um, but collective growth, it can be sustained way longer than individual growth. Hmm. And I mean, and that shows you like why, like everybody I'm discussing about, for example, they're still present in one form or the other right now. Um, and these two things, just if there's something to take away from this, these two things is we want is what we want to untangle around money. Mm. Um, how do you grow without feeling like someone is your barrier? Mm. And how do you grow with people? And we we hope to give people in the next few months and years literally a good map for money so when you kind of like wake up in the morning um we want you to know that the same way you don't need to memorize how to go from a from a one one place to another because google maps will just pretty much guide you there 
we want to be able to bring that level of precision to the lives of people mm. when it comes to money. Uh, and so we, basically, teach me how to improve my quality of life. Maybe, maybe not really teach you, because that's that's what I think happens mm. today. Guide you, show mm. you, tell you specifically what you need to do, not not what everybody needs to do. Mm. Um, for example, teach you or show you, guide you before you take an action. Because you take an action in a place. Sometimes you take an action with people, with businesses. So before you take an action, um, while taking the action, uh, after you've taken the action, how do we pretty much show you what these habits, because I talked about what these habits mean. Mm. Um, if you're not going to make your rent, for example, at the end of the year, you won't make your, it's not, you, it won't happen at the end of the year, it will happen at the beginning <laughs> of the year, right? True. And through the journey of, of, of those cases. Uh, how do we use all the advancement that's happened with science and artificial intelligence, uh, particularly to pretty much show the routes to growth, show the routes to progress, and show people that you can you can pretty much grow and grow together. Mm. Uh, and I think that um, something to really expect from us, I think over the next few years, is that all of these years, all of these things we've gone through, is going to crystallize in this Google Map for money. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's amazing. That's that's a very very good way to end it. Starting from the past and saying, "Hey, this is what the future looks like for yeah. us." That's amazing. I've learned so much today with you. I can I can recall. I will tell you the ones that really stick. I think is when you say like life is really about people, knowledge, and habits, right? Also, that growth is not linear. Life is not linear. Like there will be different paths to take, mm -hmm. right? But I guess if you just keep trying and iterating. Um, you would probably find your path into maybe Google Maps for money. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's also part around just understanding wait times and knowing that clarity is a journey on its own. So like do and keep going, but also find what keeps you at your own center. So now no matter how the world is evolving for you, it's knowing that there will always be opportunities to solve fundamental problems. Yeah. For somebody else, it might be different, but yeah. I think knowing that oh, this is my fundamental principle, regardless of how everybody else moves, yes. it just keeps you, and that collective growth is much more sustainable on, yes. than individual growth, so. And to, I want to really class. sink into that, because like, I feel like we all need to find a way to center ourselves, especially with the world we live in now. 100%. Everything wants to center you, everything wants to influence how you think, everything wants to influence your beliefs. Um, this is good, this is right, or this is inappropriate as the case is, right? And we find ourselves with fluid people, like never grounded in character or never grounded in principle, right? And it's easy to also talk about principles, especially when you have some means to live. Mm. You can't, a person who doesn't have a means to live doesn't care about principles. He's pretty much just trying to find means to live as the case is. Finding those things that ground you, your own um, finally, your own call, just like you said, I think is so important. And I also want to repeat what something you said, which is that it will be different for everyone. Yeah. Uh, for us, it's these needs that are fundamental uh, to people we want to focus on. For some, for someone, it might be something else. Yeah. It might even be what is changing that will, that will ground them as the case is right. And yeah, it's been really good time with you. Same here. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm glad to finally do this. Yeah. And I'm glad that you guys are watching this video. And I hope you stay <laughs> to the end. Thank you. If you are at this point, it yeah. means you did. So thank you so much for watching the video. Comment, share, like, download a Yowo, especially if you're in Nigeria. <laughs> Only Nigeria for now. For now. For now. Nigeria, yeah. For now. So if you're in Nigeria, definitely download a Yowo. Um, get into the future of Google Maps for money. That's a very nice way to put it right away yeah amazing thank you guys so much i will see you in the next video make sure you don't leave my channel without subscribing bye it's founds connect peace out